that about critical illness insurance and you know really where we view the critical illness uh, marketplace today. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Assurity's critical illness plan uh, in particular, but really didn't want that to be the focus today. Um, instead, I'm going to spend more of our time really talking about how this product truly is a solution uh, to a problem that most clients really don't even know exists right now. Um, and how really modern day or new school financial planning, um, in our opinion, really needs to have a uh, critical illness as a, as a part of uh, a component of that solution. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and jump in here. And I'm just going to start at a very basic level. Um, really, what is critical illness insurance? Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you are, are somewhat familiar with it. But for those of you that aren't, you know, it, it really is one of the most simplest, straightforward uh, insurance plans that, that's out there on the market. And it basically functions like this. Uh, critical illness is a plan that's going to pay a predetermined lump sum benefit uh, on the diagnosis of any of the covered conditions. You know, you'll probably hear me say a bunch of times a day, cancer, heart attack, stroke. Uh, those are the big three we like to say. And, you know, different CI plans cover different conditions. Like I said, I'll briefly go through uh, what the Assurity plans cover. But when you're thinking of critical illness, really think about those three things. Um, those are the ones that we see the majority of our claims on. And more importantly, I think those are the three illnesses uh, that are going to really speak to your clients. And, you know, the reason for that is because they are most likely going to know people firsthand uh, that have dealt with these very serious illnesses and uh, seen what those financial ramifications of the treatment and recovery process are. Um, so, like I said, we'll just go ahead and start out and talk about the two plans that Assurity offers. Uh, we have a simplified and a fully underwritten critical illness. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, we're, we're seeing kind of unique uses for both of these products. Uh, but let, let's start with the simplified issue. We're looking issue ages 18 up to 64. Uh, it's still issue age 59 in a few states. Uh, but, but for the most part, looking at anyone under 64, we're going to be able to offer uh, offer to look at for a CI plan. The lump sum benefit is going to be anywhere from $5,000 up to $50,000. Uh, and like I said, on our plan, we actually have 12 different covered conditions. I'll show you those here in a moment. Um, and the product guaranteed renewable to age 75. Uh, so this is going to terminate once the client hits 75. Uh, you can see a number of riders on here. Really the only ones I'm going to hit on uh, the return of premium rider. You know, we offer that on our simplified issue plan. Uh, if you tack this additional premium rider on, uh, the client is going to be able to get all their money back, uh, minus any claims that have been paid out when they turn age 75. Now, I want to be really clear on this on this point. Um, that is an additional cost, um, additional premium rider that if we, we tack it on, the client, again, gets the premium at age 75 when the product terminates. But even if you don't have that rider on here, we have a feature on this plan, return of premium upon death, that is included in every single uh, simplified critical illness policy that leaves the door here. Uh, so in other words, if your client dies for any reason while this policy is enforced, um, you know, say they die from some other illness or say they get into a car accident, uh, we are going to return 100% of those premiums paid into the plan uh, minus any claims that have been paid out. So I know I'm kind of being deliberate here, but just really want to point out the difference. Uh, we tack on that rider, additional premium, but we get the money back ourselves at 75. Uh, but even without the rider, our OPI death built into every single one of these. Um, you'll also notice we have a spouse rider and a children's uh, rider. That children's rider, the way it works, whether you have one kid or 10 kids, uh, that one rider is going to cover all the kids in the household, and uh, it pays out either five or a $10,000 um, option for that. The spouse rider, basically, the, the reason we don't want to use that is if we want to write both the husband and the wife, um, and we don't want to have that, that separate policy piece, well, we can put them both onto the one joint plan and uh, save a little bit of premium that way. So let's look at those 12 covered conditions. Um, as you can see, we've taken them all, and we've lumped them into three separate categories. And the reason we do this is because we use what we call the three-category approach. Um, if the client is unfortunate enough to get an illness from each of these separate categories, they can actually collect that full lump sum up to three times. So let's say, for example, we have a $50,000 CI plan, clients diagnosed with invasive cancer, but well, we send them out that check for 50 grand. 
but you know, instead of the, the policy just terminating there, uh, we're going to give them the option to keep paying premiums, keep this policy in force, uh, and then let's say a year later they have a heart attack or a stroke, anything in that second category. Well, we're going to send them a second check for $50,000. And then if they're really unlucky in another couple of years down the road, uh, they have something in that third category, say they need a major organ transplant, we would actually send them that third check for $50,000. Uh, now, we have not had anyone that's been that unlucky yet. That would really be the, the perfect storm of misfortune. Uh, but we have seen quite a few now that have paid out twice. So I think it's a real important feature uh, that we want to note on the uh, on the assurity plan in particular. A uh, couple things I'll, I'll caveat to that. These illnesses do need to be diagnosed at least 180 days apart. Uh, so the example I always use is, you know, you go to your doctor, he tells you, he or she tells you, you're diagnosed with invasive cancer. Um, you, you basically have a heart attack right there in the doctor's office when they give you the news. Well, we're going to pay out the, uh, the cancer benefit, not the heart attack benefit, as that was the, the first diagnosis. The other thing on here, you'll see some things pay a proportional benefit. Uh, angioplasty, for example, pays a 10% benefit. But we're not going to lose the remaining money in that pool with one of these uh, proportional triggers. So again, for example, we have a $50,000 plan, client has an angioplasty, we pay out the $5,000, uh, but then later on, say they still have a stroke or a heart attack, well, we'd pay out uh, the remaining $45,000 on that $50,000 plan. Uh, so that's how the, 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 the free, uh, free category approach works. Uh, I want to talk about the, the fully underwritten plan now. Uh, this one, we have the same issue ages, ages 18 to 64. But this product is actually guaranteed renewable for life. So while the other one terminates at age 75, we're going to be able to keep this one uh, as long as your client lives. Now, one thing to note on here, the benefit does cut in half when the client turns 65. So in other words, let's say we write a $100,000 plan on a 50-year-old. Well, if they get one of these illnesses after age 65, it's actually going to pay out a $50,000 benefit uh, as opposed to the full 100000 and our reasoning behind this, uh, you know, we, we, we started to price this product out, and we just saw that a level benefit product for life uh, was just pricing ourselves out of the market. It was really just too expensive because our incidence of these things, when we get into our 70s, 80s, um, you know, particularly for heart disease, uh, really skyrocket. So our solution to this, pro to this problem uh, was to create a product uh, that would have that reduction of benefit at age 65. And, you know, I think when we, we talk about the different ways we can use this money, um, you know, the, the, the beauty of it is the client can use it for almost anything. Uh, but one of the main uses for these funds that we see um, is to recover lost income. You know, a lot of times you're going to have to miss some time from work while you're going through the treatment recovery. And the hope here is that if we get that claim after age 65, you know, the need to replace that lost income won't be so great, and that we can use the rest of that benefit uh, basically for all the other uses uh, for the critical illness funds, which I'll talk again about here uh, in a couple of moments. Uh, but again, the, the big difference between these two plans, uh, the one terminates at 75, other one's good for life. Uh, this one also is going to be for bigger benefit amounts. We start at 50000 and we actually go all the way up to half a million dollar uh, critical illness plan. And we've sold quite a few of those half a million dollar plans uh, in recent years, you know, kind of in some specialized niche markets. Think of that more, you know, semi-affluent to affluent market, the doctors, the lawyers. Uh, we can kind of use uh, these, these bigger ticket plans in those cases. And also uh, in some business environments. Now, Dave and I were talking right before the call, and he's seeing people use this plan as key person insurance and in some of those other kind of business planning scenarios. So. You know, keep in mind, when you have a product that's this versatile, we can really use it to do a lot of different things. Uh, the other difference on this fully underwritten plan is instead of 12 covered conditions, there's actually 21 uh, different conditions. Now, this does vary by state. Uh, in Washington, for instance, we need to strip it down to 14 because there were some things uh, that we could not get approved as covered conditions. Uh, but really, if you look at the what's on this one that's not on the simplified, most of them are coming down in that category three. Things like blindness, deafness, loss of limb. Um, a big one on here, motor neuron disease. Uh, you know, the, the main trigger we see for that one is, uh, is ALS. Uh, and then occupational HIV infection. That's a big one in the physician market. Still a big fear of getting stuck with an infected 
uh, HIV needle. So that's a big one. Anytime you're talking to nurses or doctors, make sure you talk about that, that occupational HIV. Um, so that's kind of the company specific stuff. I want to get that out of the way right to start here. Um, so we can really get into, um, I guess, some bigger picture philosophical, you know, what is critical illness insurance and what is its place in our market today? And, you know, I want to throw a quote up here by a gentleman uh, named Dr. Marius Bernard. And the quote is, you need critical illness insurance, you know, not because you're going to die, but because you're going to survive. And uh, the reason I wanted to throw this quote up is Dr. Bernard uh, is a very important person. I think his story is one that we want to tell to every single client that we want to talk to about critical illness insurance. Um, you know, for some of you, the name Dr. Bernard might ring a bell, but I'm guessing most of you are actually thinking about Marius's brother, Christian Bernard. Uh, Christian is actually credited with performing the first successful human heart transplant. Uh, world famous heart surgeon, uh, lived down in South Africa. And uh, what many people don't know is that Marius was actually in the practice with his brother. And oftentimes Marius was the one that was performing kind of the follow-up examinations on these clients after they had the surgery to make sure that they were getting back on their feet. And in doing these follow-ups, Dr. Bernard noticed a very disturbing trend. And that was basically that for a lot of these people, right at the very point, he expected them to be getting healthy again, getting back on their feet and back to the lives they were living. Uh, many of these clients, their health conditions were actually deteriorating, and some of them were even passing away. And it absolutely drove him nuts. He thought, you know, the things me and my brother are doing, we should be saving these people's lives. I know these procedures are working. And one day he could, they kind of clicked on him that, well, the procedure itself really did exactly what it was supposed to do. But what it also did, the un unintended uh, side effect, was that the procedure itself put the client into crippling financial debt. You know, like I mentioned earlier, they're missing time from work, their medical bills are piling up, and suddenly, right at the time where they're trying to get healthy again, they're so stressed um, from, from figuring out how to make uh, ends meet that that whole stress was actually inhibiting this recovery process. So Dr. Bernard was the one that said, you know, what if we had a product that would take this whole financial strain out of the equation entirely and basically infuse, infuse some cash right into the client's hand before they even begin their treatment? You know, as soon as they're diagnosed, have that infusion of cash to help them figure out how best to get through this illness. And that was where this, this concept of critical illness insurance actually came up. Uh, Dr. Bernard took this to a number of different carriers before he finally got this little company called Crusader Life down in South Africa uh, to, to issue the first critical illness plan uh, back in like 1983. And from there, this product has really just, just, just exploded throughout the world. Uh, very, very popular in some European markets, particularly in Great Britain, very, very heavily marketed there. Um, we're seeing big sales in Australia, Japan. Um, even right across the border now in Canada. And here in the States, we're still kind of in the infancy stages. And just within these last couple of years, we've started to see us kind of reach that tipping point and this product starting to really generate some awareness and starting to have some advisors that are really heavily marketing it. And, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that we've seen that spike right when the Affordable Care Act has really kind of come into place here. It's almost created like a new market for these ancillary health products, particularly critical illness. So I want to tell you guys that Dr. Bernard's story because, you know, I think that this product functions vastly different really than any other insurance product that we've ever um, been accustomed to. And, and the reason for that is because a doctor designed it. You know, really, if, if one of us insurance carriers had come up with this product, I guarantee you we would have messed it up. You know, I probably would have looked something like this. First prove to us that a critical illness happened. I then show us how your life was impacted by your medical bills or your time missed from work. And then, then if you're lucky, you're going to get some of the benefit for which you've been paying your premium on. Now, I know that sounds pretty extreme, but, you know, think about our car insurance. We get rear-ended on the, on the highway. Well, first, we got to prove it wasn't our fault. It was the other person. Then we got to prove what the damage to our car was. And we got to prove what that damage was actually worth. You know, you get home and your home is broken into. 
okay, same thing now. We've got to prove our home actually got broken into. We didn't just leave the door unlocked. You know, we've got to prove what was taken from our home and what the value of those things inside the home actually were. And, you know, you think of any other insurance claim, and it's basically it itself is a stress-inducing process. But since Dr. Bernard designed this and the need that he was trying to fit, the claim itself is really the, the beauty of this product. Because here's how the claim is going to work. You suffer the very black and white definition inside the critical illness plan. You know, you suffer one of these illnesses that, that very clearly in black and white either is or isn't covered. And the insurance company sends you your check. And then you yourself decide how that money is going to best help you, how that cash is going to have the biggest impact on your recovery process. And that, that, to me, is truly the, the beauty of critical illness insurance. And, um, you know, we've seen focus groups in the past where we've brought this product up. And like any insurance product, when you bring up this new insurance, the, usually the, uh, the feedback is, is mainly negative. And what's really funny, though, is in these focus groups, when they have went from, from just introducing this like any other product to actually telling the Dr. Bernard story, people's perceptions change. 180 degrees. And I think from their perspective, the thought process kind of goes from, oh, okay, great, here's one other insurance product that I've never heard of that some organ you know, some insurance company wants to just get more premium dollars out of my wallet to, wow, you know, this really was a product that was invented by a doctor because he realized that the insurance world just wasn't keeping pace with the medical community. And once they realized it was, it was born out of necessity and born by a doctor, I think it really makes them realize that, you know, maybe I do need to think about critical illness insurance, even though I've never heard of it before. And, you know, to get a little bit deeper into that, I think there's, there's three realities of health that are true today more so than ever before. And if we can make the client understand these three realities, uh, I think they're going to get the why now when we talk about critical illness. And, um, you know, really to the point why a generation or two ago um, this product didn't exist because there really wasn't a need for it. So those three realities are incidents, they're survival, but survival with consequence, and randomness. So I'm going to talk about all three of these here in turn. All right, so first, incident. You know, many of us, particularly in the home offices, I think, were very guilty of this when we first started marketing the product. We thought all we have to do they just beat clients over the head with all these cancer, heart attack, and stroke statistics. And uh, they're going to realize through these stats uh, just how likely they are to get one of these illnesses and just what a need there is for this product. And I will tell you guys, there might not be any less effective way to try and sell any insurance product, or particularly this one, uh, by using statistics. I mean, imagine if we started using mortality statistics to sell life insurance. You know, I think uh, we all know that would not be a very effective strategy to, uh, to, to marketing these products. But, you know, my point is I could have got onto Google this morning and I could have, could have Googled cancer statistics and got about a million Google hits, and I could have compiled them all and put them together, and I could have thrown them up here uh, on my PowerPoint today. But, you know, if I would have, would any of you really step back and thought, Wow, Mike, that is that is great research that you did. You know, before I saw those amazing stats, I never knew a lot of people in this country were getting cancer. I never realized that heart attacks and strokes were prevalent in our society today. Well, no, of course you wouldn't have said that. Nobody would say that. And that's because we all know intrinsically that these things exist and that they are all around us and that we all have the risk of, uh, of, of catching one of these at any time. And we don't need someone to put some stats in front of our face to make us realize that. You know, and really, statistics are not that compelling. You know, I like to watch a lot of ESPN, and late at night, if you watch ESPN, you will see some of these commercials for some of the charitable foundations. And I think we could learn a lesson by how they compel us to take action. You know, the one, there's the one for the, uh, there's the one for the Humane Society that gives my fiance every single time. You know, maybe they'll throw out some stats at the start about how many millions of dogs and cats in this country are, are without a home or are hungry. But I will tell you, it's when they show that one dog, that one golden retriever that's in that cage 
that looked hungry and starving, and they zoom in on his face. Every single time they show that dog, she starts to tear up. It doesn't matter how many times she's seen it. So my point here is, let's do just like the charities. Instead of trying to get people to take action through some big statistic, let's tell that one personal story. And when we get down to that level, and we either tell the story, or even better, when we draw that story out from the client, now all of a sudden I think um, we've got a much more compelling argument to make. You know, and ultimately, really, incidents alone doesn't mean a whole lot. Because I could say 100% of us on this call today are going to have a heart attack this afternoon. You know, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that, we, that we need critical illness insurance. Uh, because if we all died from those heart attacks, hopefully we already have, have the right product. Hopefully we already own our critical illness insurance. We already own our life insurance. Uh, but that's going to take us into reality number two. And this is the one definitely more so uh, is, is truer today than ever before. And that is survival and survival with consequences. You know, frankly, our parents, our grandparents, cancer, heart attack, stroke, these other conditions, they were a death sentence. They simply were not things that we were surviving and moving on from. But now, due to earlier diagnoses, due to better treatment options, due to just a number of factors, um, we are surviving these things at a rate uh, that, that we never have before. And I'll even tell you, this might be where some statistics could actually help your cause. You know, instead of painting a set of negative life, now if we're showing statistics about how likely that client is to make it through that first bout of cancer, how likely they are to survive their first heart attack, now those are some stats that I think they're a little more willing to buy into. But I want to tell you guys a quick story, I think, that tells us why criticalness today um, and why we are surviving uh, when, frankly, 10, 20 years ago, in this partic particular case, we'd probably be talking about a death claim. So you see those numbers up there, 4, 34, 58, 56, 30, and 100. You know, especially if I took that 100, that last number off, and I asked you guys, what do these numbers look like? Probably a lot of people think it kind of looks like some lottery numbers. And we like to say this was, this was the bad luck lottery for one individual. Um, so basically, four years ago, we had a gentleman who was 34 years old, bought a $100,000 critical illness plan. Well, 58 days ago, this guy was at the gym warming up on the treadmill and suddenly went into full, full cardiac arrest and collapsed right there at the gym. Um, 56 days ago, he was awoken from a medically induced coma, and 30 days later, he got his critical illness check for $100,000. Um, so like I said, this story, I think, illuminates um, some subtle factors that just ultimately led to, to this individual's survival. Basically, as soon as he fell down onto that treadmill, 15 people in that gym pulled out their cell phones and called 911. Paramedics were on their way within a matter of seconds. Uh, luckily for him, there was a nurse warming up on a treadmill nearby, when she saw this happen, jumped off her treadmill, went and grabbed the defibrillator off the wall at the gym, and resuscitated him on the scene. The paramedics got there, they got him to the hospital, and basically, they, like I said, they medically induced a coma. They, they intentionally cooled his body to preserve his organs. And ultimately, this gentleman today is thriving and doing well. But I kind of want to break those different factors down piece by piece, uh, because you know, first of all, 10, 15 years ago, every single person on this planet didn't have a cell phone. You know, every fourth grader walking down the street didn't have their own iPhone. Uh, the defibrillator, that's something I remember growing up, you never would see a defibrillator in the gym. And now, pretty much any gym in this country is going to have one. And then we get to this intentionally cooling a body and medically inducing a coma to preserve uh, this gentleman's organs. I mean, that almost sounds like some, you know, science fiction sort of a thing. Uh, so again, due to everything, it's not just the medical community, but due to everything that's different today, uh, more times than not, what used to be a death claim, uh, you know, what, what we used to have the right solution for, now suddenly isn't a death claim. We have these same uh, sort of factors at play, but yet no checks coming in uh, to kind of help on the back end. So again, you know, old school planning would have said, Right product for cancer, heart attack, stroke, that's life insurance. But the new school, the modern planning, it's life insurance 
plus its critical illness insurance. And then finally, our third reality of health today, talk about randomness. Okay, and I think randomness is so vitally important to the marketing of critical illness insurance because if we cannot make our clients understand that these illnesses ultimately are random and could strike any one of us at any time, um, we're probably going to shrink our potential candidate pool down to those individuals that you're going to have the most trouble getting under it. Because I will tell you, if we are out proactively marketing critical illness insurance, uh, you'll find the people that are going to be the first ones that want to buy this the most, they're going to be the ones with the worst family history, and they're going to be the ones in the, in the worst health because they just perceive a bigger threat of suffering one of these illnesses. But let me ask you guys, you know, if I were to have two twin brothers, and I put them up on the screen in front of you guys today, and, you know, basically they're separated at birth. One of them went out, lived the perfect lifestyle, never drank, never smoked, worked out all the time. Uh, the other one liked to have a little bit more fun, ate too much fast food, drinks too much, doesn't like to work out, um, just really doesn't take care of themselves. You know, if I were to put them up to you guys and I said, which one of these candidates, you know, really needs critical illness insurance the most? Um, I think a lot of you guys are probably lean towards the unhealthy brother. You're going to say, yeah, all these things he's doing, that's going to lead them to getting one of, these, one of these conditions. I would actually charge, or I would actually tell you that I believe it's the opposite. I think that the brother that's healthy is the one that needs critical illness insurance. And I think we need to make them realize that as well. Uh, frankly, the unhealthy brother, <laughs> you know, he's not as likely to survive these bouts. What he probably needs is more life insurance. You know, it sounds kind of morbid, but at the end of the day, it's probably true. Because that healthy brother, that's the one that's going to fight off that first bout of cancer. That's the one that's going to make it through the heart attack and the stroke. And, you know, what's funny is, we've got funny, but when you talk to people about these illnesses um, and ask them about those around them that have been diagnosed with these things, many times they're going to tell you, yeah, you know, it was the captain on my high school basketball team. It was my healthy brother, the one that, that actually went through this. You know, our, our uh, critical illness product manager, a guy named Ken Smith, likes to talk about his two uncles. He had one uncle that smoked, one uncle that didn't, and guess which one wound up getting diagnosed with lung cancer? Of course, it was the one that didn't smoke. So I think when talking to clients about this, you really want to position this really as this is a product for you, specifically designed for you, because you're taking such good care of yourself. You're the one that needs own critical illness insurance because because you've been doing such a good job of taking care of yourself, you are the one that's likely to make it through these things. And this is more likely for you to just be a blimp in the radar as opposed to, to the end game. And, you know, I threw some names up here on the board. Patrick Swayze, Cheryl Crow, Mario Lemieux, Jim Kelly. I like those last two because they're both kind of world-class athletes. You know, if I were to ask if these individuals um, would have been people you'd have expected to be diagnosed with cancer, Probably most of you would have thought no. Um, but again, I just it doesn't matter how good of a condition, how well you can take care of yourself. You cannot mitigate away uh, the risk of being diagnosed with one of these illnesses. So again, we've got to be able to, to really sell this idea of randomness uh, because if, if we can do that, we're really going to get over one of the biggest objections of critical illness, and that is it's not going to happen to me. I take good care of myself. Uh, Dave and I were talking before the call, and he was talking about a gentleman that's been selling critical illness insurance, basically went through this exact scenario where the client was saying, no, I don't want to buy this, I'm healthy, I take care of myself, I don't, I don't need critical illness insurance. And the agent did a great job of getting the client to go ahead and buy a $100,000 CI plan. And then lo and behold, less than a year later, uh, wound up coming up with one of these illnesses and getting that $100,000 check. Uh, so very, very key. So again, the three realities of health, uh, you know, I think if we get clients to understand these three things, um, this, this whole objection of if it's so important, why have I never heard of it, can really be overcome. And that's, again, these things are happening a lot. And the good news is that we're not dying like we used to. Uh, the bad news is, though, there's, some, there's still some significant cost that comes with the treatment and recovery process. And then third, oftentimes, it's going to be that healthiest person that you know that's going to go through the, these unfortunate illnesses. Uh, next, I want to talk a little bit about um, 
how do we use these funds? You know, it's kind of the biggest blessing and curse all into one that the, the plan, the way it functions, it pays a lump sum benefit right to the client. And we don't have a lot of restrictions on how much benefit uh, we can offer, how much we can show. You know, with life insurance, we have all these needs analysis tools. With disability insurance, we have a certain maximum that we're able to offer based on income. Uh, but with critical illness, like I mentioned at the start, between our two plans, we can go anywhere from $5,000 up to a million dollars or a half a million dollars of coverage. Um, so how do we position this? You know, what are these funds, what, what are they most likely to be used for? And I think we want to be careful about not selling into a mirror. You know, I'll give you an example, uh, an analogy for this. Let's say that, that Dave and I both want to go get a new car. Both went to the uh, Mercedes-Benz dealership because we both wanted something new. Now Dave wanted it because he wanted something that would get up on the highway. And I just wanted something that was going to be safe for my family. Well, if Dave goes in there and all the sales rep is doing is talking about, you know, how highly crash test rated the car is and all the safety features, he's going to miss the sale. And likewise, if I go in there and he's just telling me how big the engine is and how fast it goes zero to 60, uh, he's not speaking to me. He's basically selling into a mirror. So instead of us doing that, what we want to do really, I think, is draw out what are those key buying triggers for the client going to be. You know, if they have this product today and they're able to utilize it, what would they find the most beneficial uses for these funds? So I think a good, real easy way to do that is when we introduce this product and we talk to the client a little bit about how it functions and what it is, simply at that point ask them, you know, do you have any thoughts about how people have used this benefit in the past? You know, you mentioned your brother John was diagnosed with cancer. If he came home that night and there was a check for $50,000 waiting on the kitchen table, how would he have made the best use of it? And whatever reasons they give you, I think that's what we want to pivot around and that's what we want to talk about, how this product can be a solution and a way to make those things possible. You know, because really at the end of the day, no matter what we're using this plan on, uh, here's what a critical illness is going to give somebody. It's going to give them options. It's going to give them control. It's going to give them some choice and a feeling of independence. Um, and finally, it's going to reduce stress. Again, that's why Dr. Bernard created this plan, to make sure that his client's stress was reduced and that that financial strain was not inhibiting uh, everything else that him and his brother were working so hard to do. But, you know, let me ask you guys right now if these, th these key trigger words here are going to carry a lot of weight. I mean, at what time in our country's history have clients probably been more excited to learn about an insurance product that's going to give them a sense of control and choice and give them some more options in how their health care is managed uh, than what we're dealing with here in the last couple of years. You know, here's a list, and it's a partial list, some of the ways we've seen people use these funds. Um, you know, accessing non-traditional treatments, getting outside of your network, getting to those medications that might not be approved uh, by your health insurance, uh, but, you know, even on the other end of that, there's, there's other costs that we see that aren't necessarily created by the illness, but there are things that we say should be created by the illness. So in other words, you know, if you have this plan, now maybe you do have the option to get that hotel beside MD Anderson or beside the Mayo Clinic and not have to make the, you know, I've heard these stories of the 100-mile the commute back and forth each day while the client's receiving their treatment. Um, or even you look at that bottom one, the Pebble Beach in Paris. We've seen, uh, we've seen instances where the client is basically deemed with terminal cancer, and they say, you know, I don't want to live the last couple of weeks, couple of months of my life in a hospital bed. I want to use this critical illness check uh, as a means to do kind of my bucket list and go take, take a trip with my family and enjoy the final days. So, again, don't, um, you know, don't get wrapped up or, or down one specific rabbit hole on what these funds are used for, because clients will come up to uses for this money that you probably never would have thought of. And you know, I want to say, the uncovered medical costs, this could or could not be a big trigger based on the experience that that client has been through. You know, if they know someone that struggled to pay their co-pays and had to go outside a network for their treatment, this will be a huge pressure point for them. But if not, I think we could, again, if we're selling into that mirror, we could completely miss the sale. So I think a good way to kind of to kind of vet that out is to simply ask, do you know anyone that struggled with uncovered care costs? 
Have you seen people struggle to pay their co-pays, their deductibles, their hospital bills? If they tell you yes, then I think let's talk about how critical illness can be used as a mechanism to make sure we can pay those costs. But if they tell you no, you know, if they come back and say, yeah, you know, my, uh, my neighbor Tim, he was diagnosed with cancer and, you know, he's, he's doing well now, went through his recovery, doesn't seem like he, uh, he faced any financial hardship. Well, let's not paint ourselves into the corner of, of how this is a, a gap filler in a major med plan. Instead, let's pivot to all the other ways uh, we can use this, this benefit uh, to make this, this situation so much more manageable. I want to give you guys what we call the four-question critical illness meeting. You know, if you forget everything else that I talked about today, uh, please, I urge you guys, write these down, put a little star by them, put an asterisk by them, and try asking these to your clients. Because time and time again, we have found our most successful agents, they ask these questions, these four questions in, in some sort of a fashion. And it simply is, do you know anyone or, or who do you know? Who do you know to had cancer, heart attack, or stroke? And then did they plan it or was it unexpected? And kind of a rhetorical question here. I don't think anyone ever plans or expects to get these illnesses, but that's the point. That's what we're wanting to get at. Make them think about that person close to them and how suddenly their entire world was upended when they found out they had one of these illnesses. And then was there unplanned emotional or financial strain on the household? And that key word there is emotional. Because again, we're going to run into people that were lucky enough to get through one of these illnesses and not go into crippling financial debt. But I'll tell you, even in those cases, you can't tell me there wasn't significant emotional strain on the household. And even in those cases, leading down to question four here, would cash have helped? Even in those cases where maybe the person didn't need the money just to make ends meet, gosh, would it not have made it such a more palatable experience if they would have had a check for $25,000 or for $50,000 uh, know, to help them just be more comfortable, if nothing else, while we're going through these illnesses? So again, I really urge you guys, try out these four questions. See what kind of response that you get from your clients and see if that leads you down the road to, to a real serious uh, critical illness discussion. And ultimately, I really think by asking those four questions, uh, you can really start having some success in marketing this plan. Uh, real quickly on the, the underwriting on these plans, uh, since we do have, it, it, it's quite different on the two products. You know, the simplified app, it's just that. It's a short form, accept, reject app. Here's our picture. We're not going to go through all the questions, but basically, you know, you go through the health and the family history question. If you get a yes, let's not even submit the app because it's going to be a decline. Uh, but if we get no's all the way down, as long as that client's being forthright with you, uh, you can be pretty confident we're going to get the, the policy issued for you. Um, you see, we do have a quick quote calculator. I will send this to Dave. I think he's already got it, but I'll make sure he gets this out to all of you guys. For the second time, I'm not going to click on the link, but basically we have a way you can quote that simplified issue critical illness uh, without having to go to any sort of a secure portal. You know, you won't have to get onto a sure link and log in. Um, you can just put this up as a bookmark. Uh, on your web browser, you go in and run a, run a simplified CI quote with really just a matter of two or three minutes. Uh, and then finally, we do have an underwriting pre-screen for the fully underwritten plan. Um, you know, I like to say that fully underwritten CI, it's kind of more on par with like a preferred life uh, sort of a look of a client. So, you know, you got to be in pretty good health in order to get it. We are going to look a little bit at family history, uh, but I know Dave's got this sheet as well, so he'll get this out to you. Anytime you guys have a client that um, you want to make sure we vet, you're going to be able to get pretty much any underwriting info uh, that's going to come into play right here on this one sheet. Send it into AIM, and they'll be able to uh, get you a preliminary assessment, and um, hopefully more times than not, give you the, the go-ahead to go ahead and get an app here in-house. Uh, so with that, I know we went just a little bit over, uh, but definitely have all the time. If you guys uh, have any questions, I'd love to, uh, love to field those at this time. Hey, thanks, Mike. I'm just in the process of unmuting people. If they have any questions, they can bring them up right now. So just give me another second here, and I'll have everybody unmuted. Okay. That was all really good information, by the way, Mike. Thanks for sharing that with us. Um, hopefully, you all out there have be will benefit from this and have a chance to maybe start a conversation with your existing clients about the importance of this type of insurance and the need to have it. 
and the pressure can kind of take off your clients when in, indeed they potentially do get a diagnosis of a, of a tough condition. So I have unmuted everybody. If anybody has a question of myself or Mike out there, um, Dave, now Dennis. would be the time to bring it up. Dennis? Yeah, hi. Uh, you're going to get that quick quote uh, calculator link to us? Yeah, I will do that for you, Dennis. Thank you. Hey, Dave. Yes. Darren Brown. Hey, uh, this question is from Mike. Mike, in the beginning you talked about the different categories with the potential for multiple claims off of the same face amount. I was curious to <laughs> seeing in actuality, uh, in terms of claims, uh, once a, a person qualifies for a claim in one of the three categories, uh, of their continuing to carry the policy and paying premiums in anticipation of having future claims in those other categories. What kind of experience do you see? Yeah, that's a good point you bring up. Um, and it's one thing that we're, we're always trying to make sure people understand uh, because there are a lot of one and done plans out there and I think um, from the client's perspective they think, okay, this product, it did what it needed to do. I guess I'm done with it now. Um, I, I couldn't be able to give you know, hard percentage, but you are correct. There are a fair amount of people that after they get that first claim, um, unfortunately, they let the, the product go ahead and, and expire at that point. Uh, but, you know, I think that's where uh, between our work and your work, hopefully we can make them realize, hey, you know, just because you close out that one category, uh, there's still a darn good chance that these other two could come into play for you. And uh, like I said, we've kind of seen that now to where we've had, I, don't, I couldn't give you a hard number, but I know multiple cases now that I've actually paid out multiple times. And then a quick follow-up to that question. Uh, does the same apply to category one of cancer where if it's cancer in situ that that still would not knock them out from a life-threatening cancer claim in the same category? Correct. Yeah, we would just we would just reduce by whatever we had paid out on the uh, on the non-invasive. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions out there for either myself or Mike? Yeah, Dave, this is Alan Lynn. I have some questions for Mike. Okay. Okay. There's a $50 annual policy premium that goes along with this policy. Is that included in either an annual, you know, the annual fee for if they pay annually or a monthly fee, or is it paid separate of those? Uh, yes, that is built in. Oh, well, echo there. It is built into the, to the annual fee. Okay, so it is in with with the annual fee and the monthly fee? Mm-hmm. Uh, another question. If somebody has cancer in situ, it's a different spot from the first. Is it payable a second time for that one, or is that the first payment that they had, is that take care of it only once in a lifetime? On the, um, yeah, on the cancer in situ, it would just pay out just the one, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. In the health section of the simplified issue, it's uh, section five, the second question. If somebody has listed that they had a heart attack, in, for instance, if it was 10 years ago, is that a knockout? Yeah, for us on the simplified issue, well, actually for both products, um, it's going to be a lifetime knockout if they've had, if they've really had any of the covered conditions, cancer, heart attack, stroke especially. Okay. We've seen a few. We've seen a few situational care uh, cases where we've been able to exclude something in category three. Uh, even that is pretty rare. Uh, I'll give you an example. That you can see that we have uh, paralysis as a covered condition. I know recently we were able to offer a uh, paraplegic uh, a critical illness plan that he purchased. Okay. But, but yeah, for the most part, it is. It's going to be a knockout. Um, and for, the reason for that is on our definition of these diagnoses, if we're paying on the first ever diagnosis of one of these conditions. Uh, so in order to exclude something like a heart attack or exclude cancer or stroke, it just it's too much value, I think, out of the plan to, to still be able to offer it. All right. And one last question. Uh, the benefit that's paid out, is that taxable or non-taxable? Yeah, it is 100% uh, tax-free. Okay. Yeah. Now we have, you know, we get a lot of questions on that, and if we're getting into an environment where we're, we're like selling this in a work site, um, or if uh, you know the employer's offering it, there is the potential that if they deduct those premiums, 
that we could see this benefit as being taxable. We haven't seen that happen yet, but you know, kind of just in case, we've always taken a conservative approach. And if it is an employer providing this for their their employees, you know, we advise them not to write the the premiums off as a business expense. Okay. okay. Any other questions out there for myself or Mike? Good. Yes. All very good questions, by the way. Thanks, Alan. Okay, this question is for Dave. Dave, do I have to be contracted with this company? Well, you have to be appointed to sell, but you don't have to be appointed to talk about it. Okay, if I'm already contracted with A. <clears throat> well, we have to verify that you're appointed. If you want to actually sell this particular policy, we have to make sure that you're appointed with the surety. Getting appointed with AIM, you're, you're never just appointed with American Independent Marketing. You're appointed with one of the carriers we represent. I see. Okay. Okay, if that's it for questions, we'll wrap this thing up. Thanks again for taking the time to join Mike and I. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much uh, for taking your time out of your day to uh, spend some time with our people out here in the field. Uh, everybody have a great uh, rest of the week, and we'll look forward to seeing you all soon. The link to our website is on my screen right now. That's where you go to view recorded sessions. Right on the home page, you click on News and Events. Down the right-hand side is a calendar of the upcoming webinars, but you can go backwards in time and view back into the various topics. Click on it like you're going to register for that webinar that already happened, and it will take you to a link to view the recorded session on YouTube. There's my phone number and my name. Um, my email address is Dave, dave.whalen at yaim.com. Uh, happy to have any further discussions with any of you after the webinar uh, this morning. But thanks again for joining me, and have a great day, everybody.